Hi there, I'm Eddie O'Donnell. Welcome to my shop. As you can see, it's pretty small. I live in New York City and in my apartment, this closet is about all the extra space I could muster to do all my uh, woodworking projects in. And that's what I plan to share with you guys. I've got a few projects to do around the house, starting with this one, which is a little clock that we have bought here for the house. And we decided to buy it mostly because we thought it would look really good with a nice wood backing and that's a simple project for me to do um, and to make everyone happy with the way that it looks. So let's jump right to that. So I've got a couple of planks here of mystery wood that I yanked off a pallet not too long ago. It's certainly not in good condition. Cupped, sort of twisted, but once we cut it all up and surface everything, I think it'll make a really nice backer for this. I particularly like the color, that sort of dark brown red. is certainly within what I was looking for. We're definitely going to have uh, an interesting time trying to get this prepped for finish, but overall I think it's going to make a really fun project, so let's hop right to it. Now the clock is about 15 inches in diameter, so we're just going to measure that out and make basically a 15 by 15 square. And we're going to cut everything with hand tools. That's pretty much primarily what I've been working with here in the shop. Hand tools uh, and a few power tools here and there, depending on when I need to speed up my workflow. But in this case, I think we can accomplish this whole project with just a few hand tools. All right, so let's make a few marks here at 15 inches. Got my bench hook here. We'll go ahead and cut this guy to length and we'll do this for all of the boards. There we go. And now we've got a board that we can use to mark off the rest of our cuts. Again, not too worried about accuracy here, although it's always good in these moments to practice the things that you want to be good at. So for example, if you want to be good at freehand cutting with a handsaw, in these moments, you might as well take the time to focus on every cut that you're making. That way, when it comes time to make an important cut, you have the skills to back that up. Now I've got a stack of boards cut and ready to be surfaced. So there's gonna be two things that we're gonna focus on when surfacing these boards. The important first thing to do is to make sure we can get the edges jointed so that we can get them all to line up nicely. But at the same time, I'm gonna address these faces of the boards whilst they're small like this. A little bit easier to get these relatively flat when they're smaller, there's gonna be less overall twist and warp in them. Um, and that's going to be the first thing that we're going to do here. Planing. Small boards like this are good for a planing stop. I've got one right here at the end of my bench with a little twist lock mount on there. That's a nice way for some of these small boards just because I can butt them up against there and take them in and out as needed. Boards as small as this will also fit in my vise. In this particular vise, the face has a couple of very tight dogs that I need to hit with a hammer to get them to protrude. And I could certainly open this up and plane on this surface as well. And sometimes that's needed if you really have something where the grip of a vise is important so that the piece doesn't move around on you. That being said, it's a lot less convenient because every time you want to look at the face and address what you're seeing, or if you need to change direction based on the grain, you have to undo the vise. Not to mention, got to deal with these dogs. I find for most general planing, throwing it up against some sort of uh, planing stop is a really easy way to, to do it. I'm not taking off a particularly heavy shaving right now, but one that is removing enough material for me to begin to see what's going on here. Dressing 
hitting some general high spots here, just trying to get things down level so that the plane has hit every surface. Again, not looking for pure flatness, more so as much as I'm looking to get the, the board looking really nice. All right, now that we've addressed all the board's faces, one of the most important things to do when you're in a small shop is to clean up. Clean up at every step makes the clean up at the end of the day a little bit easier. So that's what I'm gonna do, do a little bit of dusting. We're gonna move on to dressing the edges of these guys. Essentially what we're gonna be doing is we're gonna be focusing off of the one face that we've really smoothed out, in this case, this face for this board. We're gonna try and get a nice square edge to that. And we want this edge to be flat along its length and square to the face this way. Now traditionally, jointer plane like this would be used for that kind of task, obviously, this is much larger than this board, so it's a little bit overkill. I have it, so I'm gonna use it. That being said, you could always do this with a number five or even the number four that we used to smooth this guy out more than adequate to joint the edges of these boards. Something nice about using every plane that you have though, particularly if you have a few. Now essentially the way that I know that the board is flat across its length is when I can take a shaving from the front all the way to the end in sort of one pass. Yep, there we go, nice singular clean shaving. Always checking when you can to make sure that you're staying square. All right, now that we have everything milled up, we've got nice straight edges on everything and you can tell that by squeezing two boards together. The first thing that I always wanna do when I glue up is I wanna rehearse it. You wanna be ready for all the different things that can happen. Now, I think a lot of people go a little overboard with the clamping pressure on glue ups. They expect that they need a million clamps and that's not about overall clamping pressure. That is about getting even pressure across the boards. I like using quick setup glues. I have this sample from one of the places that I work at, Tools for Working Wood. This is a sample of the 4-4 glue that we produce. It is a great glue for this sort of project. It tacks up nice and fast. That also means that it doesn't have a great, it doesn't have a greatly long open time. That being said, for a glue up this simple, it doesn't really need one. I'm just gonna get glue onto all of my surfaces here. And then I'm just gonna just get this guy up here like this. Now this glue is nice because it'll also clean up with some water. So I've got a little spray bottle down below ready for when I need it. Perfectly. All right, 
get that side clamped up. Let's clamp this side up. Let's get there. There. All right, and we're just going to wait about an hour for this guy to set up. All righty. So the glue set up on this. Just enough time passed for that to be over and done with. Now what I got to do is we got to make sure that we can get the right circular shape cut out for this. So I'm just going to find the right place for this. I'm grab my bow saw and we are going to tension this guy up a little more. Just, I think I just undo it once. Yeah, there we go. Sing it. All right, so now we have this tensioned up, and we're just going to go around, and I'm going to cut pretty close to the line. I'm not going to get right next to it. After this, I'm actually going to clean it up with the spoke shave um, and make these curves really, really nice. We're going to put a nice chamfer on the inside and on the outside of it that give it a little bit of depth, a little three-dimensionality to it, but also because it's not super flat, it's not going to sit perfectly flush to the wall, and that's going to help sort of hide that feature behind it. So... All right, last piece of the pie. All right. So it's important we save those scraps so we can take a look at what finishing is going to look like a little bit later. Now, as you can see, it's a pretty irregular circle. We have a lot of places where I got pretty close to the line and some places where I wandered away from the line. Again, sort of making sure not really to hit the line because now we're going to be able to clean it up. Now, the really, really high spots where you can see like this area right here, areas where there are big flats like here and here and here, I'm going to hit those with a rasp first, just to get those places down. And now we're going to go to the spoke shave. You don't need one more complicated than just a regular straight one. I've got a curved one here. I tend to like those a little bit better. They're a little bit more flexible overall in terms of what you can use them for. And we're essentially just going to try and take a nice light cut to just fair all this out. Now it's tough because a lot of what we're going to be working on as we run our spoke shave here is going to be end grain. So the sharper and the lighter the cut that you can take, the better. In fact, I'm just going to... Now that is a jolly round. It's not perfect, but it's jolly round and it's what we need. So now that we have that done, I'm gonna put a bevel all the way on the inside and all the way on the outside. I'm gonna use a small block plane to do that. One like this, it's nice and sharp, and we're gonna make a really nice, easy control bevel on both sides. Sharpness matters here. A little nice visual detail that's going to help add some depth to our project here. So what we're going to use for finishing this is dark tongue oil from Real Milk Paint. Now, this stuff is gonna help this get really, really nice and dark, which I'm really excited for. I think that's gonna make it look really, really good. This stuff is also super natural, super low VOC. It is just pure, unrefined tongue oil, and I think it's gonna look good for this. We don't need a lot of protection because this is not something that's gonna get handled. I'm only gonna finish the one side of it, 
So I'm not too worried about trying to build up layers and how long this is gonna take. I'm gonna put a couple of coats of this on. And we're gonna go over how I'm gonna do that. I like to use white pads. White pads are synthetic, non-abrasive pads. They're not like um, lint-free cotton rags or anything like that, uh, or anything similar to a paper towel. What they are is a synthetic weave plastic, essentially, that is abrasive in the same way that a 4 aught steel wool is abrasive. So if you take that white pad and you step it up to a slightly coarser grit, like a gray pad, that's similar to 3 aught steel wool. So I'm a real big fan of them. I like the idea of finishing with a little bit of a grit. Uh, helps create a little bit of a slurry, helps create some adhesion. I like that for oil finishes and particularly for wax finishes. Anything with that wax, it's really, really nice when the abrasive pad or the quote-unquote non-abrasive pad, the pad with a little bit of tooth to it though, shoves the wax into the pores of the wood creating a really really nice connection there. In this case, because we're just using an oil, it's not that big of a deal. Now one thing to remember with things like pure tongue oil, boiled linseed oil, and other products that are oil-based, there is the chance for spontaneous combustibility with your rags. So if you do anything like this, even if you use the white pad, make sure you hang that stuff up to dry before you throw it away. If you just start chucking it in the trash, it could create its own heat, set itself on fire, and you could have a trash fire. Too many horror stories I've heard of that. So let's keep it safe. Let me grab a white pad. To help it soak in and create a lot of that nice texture that we want, I'm just gonna thin it out a little bit with some citrus solvent here that is Real Milk Paint's proprietary low VOC solvent. It's really nice stuff, smells really nice. It's expensive though, and it's a little hard to get your hands on. So, so I'm just going to pick up a little bit of that finish there and just going to spread a nice thin layer on. Now I know that there are these areas that have a little bit of that tear out in them. So I'm just going to be careful when I go over those areas. I'm going to try and pull away from the torn out areas and try not to catch any of those fibers of the white pad in there. Whilst in the rest of the places, I really am going to try and go in circles. Help create that very, very, very fine slurry between the oil and the wood. Helps create a really, really nice finish. Wow, that dark tongue oil really brings a lot of color to what we're working on here. I'm just going to pick up some of this excess. I'm going to bring it over here. One of the biggest things here is that we don't want to leave too much on the surface. The more we leave on the surface, the more we're going to have to clean up later with a clean rag. That's one of the important things with these kinds of finishes. Really the second stage is always going to be wiping away any excess after letting it soak in for a certain period of time. I'm just going to work this in as much as I can. So I've got a nice thin coat everywhere. I'm just going to quickly go over the edge so that that um, so that the edge that shows looks nice and finished. Just do that one second once I've yeah once we've got a nice consistent even coat on here. Wow, love the way that looks, guys. Yeah, I'm just going to quickly go over the edge again. I'm not trying to create a ton of protection here. This is more just for looks than for anything else. Now I know that that end grain is going to want to soak up a little more. Get a little extra on here. Thinning this tongue oil out is quite important when it comes to the first application, particularly because It's always harder to get something thicker like that to really soak in. In this case, we're able to do that because we thinned it out just a little bit. 